I would like to welcome you here to the First United Methodist Church of Interlochen and thank you so much for taking some of your valuable time and tuning in to listen to a message. It is May the 1st, 2022. Brand new month, brand new day, May the 1st. And if you'll notice on the calendar, May has five Sundays uh, during this particular month. So in light of having five Sundays, we're gonna have our formal communion next Sunday, May the 8th, when we'll have our formal communion out of the United Methodist Temple. So be in touch for that. And when next week comes, make sure you have a small piece of bread, a little bit of grape juice, so you can take part in the Lord's Supper as we have the Lord's Supper uh, on the computer and on the calendar and all that. Again, that's uh, formal communion next Sunday, May the 8th. Today is May the 1st and how fast time goes. The winter is behind us, it's a new season, it's getting warm here in Florida and everything like that and it's such a blessing. Folks, each time I go to the doctor, he always kind of tells me the same thing. Dave, you need to trim down and lose weight. And secondly, Dave, get some exercise. So I've been trying to do that. I've been trying to watch the different foods I eat. I'm trying to exercise more. And fortunately, with the summer coming and the mowing season being uh, on, the, on the agenda, I'm going to have to be mowing and trimming and doing lawn work, and that'll help me to get some exercise. So hopefully with some exercise and with some portion control and eating and things like that, I'll be able to trim down and listen to what my doctor is saying. You know, years ago, I remember jogging became real, real popular, and a lot of people jogged. And then people found after time that it was very hard on their knee joints and their ankles from the constant pressure of jogging and running. So doctors started suggesting people that they take a walk. And walking is a great form of exercise. You use a lot of your organs, a lot of your limbs when you're walking, especially your legs. And so walking has become a great form of exercise. And especially if you walk somewhere with a scenic view. We're only a few miles away here from the Ravine Gardens in Palaka, Florida. And a lot of people like to put on a nice pair of tennis shoes and walk in the Ravine Gardens. They can see all the lovely flowers that are blooming, the azaleas this time of year, the different plants and flowers and shrubs and bushes that they have there at Ravine Gardens. A lot of people like to walk that during their lunch hour for exercise or either before or after their job. Well, I want to take a walk with you today, a walk down an old dusty country road on the road to Emmaus. So if you would like to turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, we're going to be picking up with verse 13. And as I normally do, I'm going to be teaching out of the New International Version of the Bible. Very readable English, very up to date, the NIV. So if you'd like to turn to your Bible and follow along with me, you can. If you don't have an NIV, that's okay. The wording might be a little different, but it'll have the same meaning basically in all the different translations. But before we do that, 
Let's look to the Lord and ask for his blessing upon our time together. Father, Bible study without your Holy Spirit is like a pancake with no butter or syrup on it. We really need you, Lord, to open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds to the things you have for us in the scriptures. So I just pray now, Father, you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. You'd fill everybody out there listening with the Holy Ghost, that we'd be able to understand your word, Lord, and see what it means for us today. We just pray your touch and your blessing, Lord, on each one of us this very day. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the road to Emmaus. This is the afternoon after resurrection morning on Sunday. In the afternoon, as these two disciples of the Lord have been traveling. Now, we're going to pick up here at verse 13 in Luke chapter 24. It says, Now that same day, day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So they're walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and it's a journey of about seven miles. Now, it says in verse 14, they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. They're having a conversation, having a discussion about all the things that had transpired over Good Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, and the different things at the end there of Holy Week. Of course, they don't know it was Holy Week, as we're going to see as we go through here. But they're basically talking along the way. You know, most people had to walk wherever they went somewhere in ancient times. Few people that were wealthier had perhaps a, a donkey or a horse or something like that, but most people walked wherever they went. There was no radio to listen to, no MP3 player or anything like that, so they talked and had conversations, much like we do today when we're driving somewhere, going to a restaurant, going to a particular destination. It says they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things, verse 15, with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Now, that's not anything unusual in ancient times because you many have many travelers on the road. And people would recognize other travelers. Sometimes they didn't know who they were, but they would walk along together and talk about various things. People would, would share friendships and things this way. And notice verse 16 says, but they were kept from recognizing him. Over in the Gospel of Mark says he appeared in a different form. So Jesus changed himself supernaturally to appear in another form, and they were kept from recognizing them. Now in verse 17, he asked them, and this is Jesus, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the way? They stood still, their faces downcast. You know, I think that is so, so telling. Jesus asks what they're talking about, and they stand still, and they're so downcast. They're depressed. They're discouraged. Because for what had happened to them, a pin had burst their bubble. Their dream had evaporated. What they had hoped for for so, so long had been crushed. See, they were hoping and looking for a political messiah. They were looking for a great ruler who would arrive on a white horse. He would throw off the yoke of the Roman bondage. He would get rid of the oppressiveness that Rome had placed on the Israelite people, on the Jews of that day. He would restore Israel to its greater glory and power like under the reigns of David and Solomon and make Israel the greatest superpower in the world of that day. That's the kind of Messiah they were looking for. They had emphasized and thought about the ruling king passages, but they had neglected the ones about the suffering servant. So for them, their bubble was burst, their dream had died, and they're down and depressed and downcast. It's only natural when you have an expectation that you want to come true, and that expectation doesn't happen, that it causes depression. You can't do anything about it. They stood still, and their faces were downcast. Now let's pick up in verse 18. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? I mean, you're just a visitor, but you haven't even heard about what happened? 
And I love what Jesus says here, verse 19. What things, he asked. <laughs> now we know that Jesus knows everything. Jesus is God Almighty. He is omniscient, a big term for meaning that he knows everything. Yet he asked them the question, two simple words, what things? And he does this to open up a dialogue to get them talking about the situation as he gradually reveals himself. You know, folks, getting to know the Lord is really like peeling back the layers of an onion. You take off the outer husk, and there's a little bit more husk that you still have to take off. You peel off one layer of the onion, there's another layer there. You peel off another layer of that onion, and you just keep peeling and peeling and peeling until you get to the very core and the very heart of the onion. And that's the way a walk with God is. You get to know him a little bit at a time as he peels us back like a layer of onion and reveals things to us, and we can draw closer to him. So Jesus asks, what things, he asks. They answer him, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Look at this. They say he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed. They trusted him as a prophet. They realized he was a spokesman that had come from God. And notice it says he was powerful in word and deed. What Jesus said, he lived out. He had done miracles. He'd opened the eyes of the blind. He caused the deaf to hear, the lame to walk. He'd done all kinds of miracles, and he was powerful in what he said and also the deeds that he did. Remember that verse that says, as he taught them, he taught with authority and not as the scribes. He had the authority of God, so he was powerful in word and in deed. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. Verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. They killed him. He was crucified. Verse 21, here's their false dream. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Again, they were short-sighted. They were looking for a temporary political savior. Jesus came as an eternal spiritual savior. You see, folks, the greatest problem that you and I have is we are born as sinners. We are born with a sinful nature. David said in Psalm 51, in sin, my mother conceived me. Now, he's not talking about her conceiving him in a sinful way because she was married to David's father when David was born. He's talking about the fact that he's born a sinner with a sinful nature. And our greatest need is to have our sins forgiven. And that's what Jesus would ultimately do when he died on the cross and made a complete and full payment for all our sins. But they were short-sighted. They were looking for somebody temporary who was going to throw off Rome's yoke, redeem Israel, buy Israel, and make Israel great like she was a thousand years ago during the reign of David. So their short-sighted dream, the bubble was burst, the dream died, and that's why their faces were downcast as we saw earlier passage. Now let's pick up verse 21 again. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. It happened now three days ago, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and this is their Sunday afternoon walk. Then they go on and say in verse 22, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They, they just amazed us by this report they had, okay? Can't women amaze you men sometimes? They really can. Just like sometimes I feel like I know my wife and I know she's going to react, she'll do something completely different and she amazes me. Well, these women right here are amazed him, okay? Look what it says. They went to the tomb early this morning, verse 23, but didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. They're really confused now with this going on, okay? Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not see. So not only is their dream died, not only are their faces downcast, but they're confused 
about this report of the tomb being empty. Notice it doesn't say that they believed or anything like that. It just says they were confused and didn't know what had gone on. And after Jesus lets them talk and have this conversation, he comes in with the big truth in verse 25. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. What was their problem? They didn't fully understand the Old Testament. They didn't fully know the Old Testament. And they were basically slow of heart and also uh, to believe, slow in their knowledge of all the prophets that spoken. Look at verse 26. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Didn't Jesus have to go through these things? Didn't Messiah have to do this? Verse 27. This is a key verse in the passage. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What does he do? Jesus opens the scriptures to him. Notice it says he began with Moses and all the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He probably went back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses said that one day God would raise up a prophet similar to himself who would be powerful in word and deed, and all the people should listen to him because God would put his very words in that new prophet's mouth. He probably talked to him about some of the Psalms, like Psalm 16, where God said he would not let the Messiah, he would not let his Holy One see corruption, but he would be raised from the dead and not have his body corrupted. He might have spoken about Psalm 22, where it says, they pierced my hands and feet. And in Psalm 22, you have a graphic description of a crucifixion prophesied a thousand years before it happened to Jesus on the cross. Back in ancient Israel, the way of capital punishment was to take somebody out and put him in a pit and stone him to death. Crucifixion wasn't even developed until around 400 B.C., originally by the Phoenicians, and then the Romans adopted that as a form of capital punishment, which they really popularized and they're known for. They found ancient bones in Israel in archaeological sites which show nails driven through hands and driven through feet, and it was basically the skeletal remains of someone who'd been crucified. Jesus might have spoken about Psalm 22, prophesied a thousand years ahead of time. He perhaps talked about Isaiah 53, where it said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, yet the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity. Saul. The suffering servant prophecies about how Messiah had to suffer. And Jesus began at Moses and all the prophets and explained all these scriptures to them. Man, I love to have heard that sermon. One day when we get to glory, maybe we can ask to hear that sermon that Jesus spoke to these two men and how they reacted to it. Now let's go on. Verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further. They were going to stop there at Emmaus, and Jesus acted as if he was going a little bit further. Look at verse 29. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. You know one cool thing I see in this passage? Jesus has to be invited in order to spend time with him. He'll never force himself upon anybody. God is a perfect gentleman. Jesus says in Revelation... I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come in and have dinner with him, and he with me. I'll have fellowship with him, and he with me. But you have to be the one to open the door. You have to invite Jesus in. He's going to travel on, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now look closely at verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. What does this remind you of? The Lord's Supper. 
Remember, after the Passover meal, Jesus took a piece of bread, a loaf of bread, and broke it, and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat this, all of you, for this is my body, which is broken for you, for the forgiveness of sins. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and be given to give it to them. Verse 31. Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and poof, he disappeared from their sight. Wow. Not only did Jesus open the scriptures to them earlier in the passage that we're studying here, but now their eyes were opened, and they recognized it was him. With their very eyes, these two disciples, Cleophas, and the other one, we don't know what his name was. Some people say Luke, but we're not exactly sure. The scripture doesn't tell us. And if the scripture is silent, we have to remain silent. We can only speak according to the word tells us. But they saw with their very eyes the resurrected Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how they felt? And then, boom, he disappears. You know, that doesn't shock me. God can do anything. Psalm 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He's done whatsoever he hath pleased. Jesus said, If these people would, would quit praising me, the rocks would cry out. God can do anything he wants to because he's Almighty God. And boom, he disappears and he's gone. So not only first did he open the scriptures to them, now he opens their eyes. Let's continue on. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Now, these guys must have been really excited. They had just gotten done a seven-mile journey on foot from Jerusalem to Emmaus, but after seeing the resurrected Christ, it's like they're electrified. And they get up at once to go seven miles back all the way to Jerusalem. And why did they do that? To tell the other disciples, hey, we have seen him. He came in and was having dinner with us. Our eyes were opened, and it was Jesus. We have seen him. Man, we got to tell these guys. You know, people talk about what they're excited about, don't they? I can spend two or three minutes with anybody that I meet, and in a short amount of time, I can tell you what they're into and what they're excited about. People talk about what they're into. And so what do these guys want to talk about? What they had just experienced, the resurrected Christ. Now look what they said. They asked each other, verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Not only did Jesus open the scripture, not only did Jesus open their eyes, Jesus opened their hearts. And their hearts began to burn within them when, while they were listening to the word of God and listening to the message. Why? The spirit was putting the words on their heart they were hearing from Jesus, the Son, and the Spirit working together with the Father supervising all events, and their hearts burned within them. I can't help but think of John Wesley's personal conversion, where he went and was hearing a message on Luther's preface to the Romans about justification by faith. And John Wesley said, I felt my heart strangely warmed, and I knew that Christ had died and died for me personally. And many people think that was John Wesley's conversion experience after he'd already been an Anglican priest for a period of time. But he was born again, he was made new, and had his heart strangely warmed, just like these fellows. Folks, Jesus is a person that will open the scriptures to you and help you understand. Crack open your Bible. He'll open up your eyes and help you to be able to understand the Word and see Him in the Word. And then He'll open up your heart and really change you and make you a new person each and every day as he's peeling back the layers on that onion and making you a better person. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. Didn't stop for anything. They're going to go seven miles straight back. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying... It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. It's true. They've got to share what they've seen. They saw the resurrected Christ. They shared with the other apostles. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Again, in the act of giving, Jesus is recognized to them. 
While they were still talking about, about this, now look at this. Here's another key one. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus appears out of nowhere. Just like he vanished and was gone, now he appears out of nowhere. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. Very natural reaction. This can't be real. This is a ghost, and they were scared. Every time God appears through an angel or through a revelation in Scripture, the people are always scared. Okay? But what does he say? Why are you troubled, he said, and why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. And look closely at this. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Not just a spiritual resurrection, not just a humanitarian resurrection where the spirit of Christ still lives here, he shows himself in a physical body with flesh and bones and says, you can reach out and touch me. And to prove it, look at this, verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still not, not believe it because of joy, why? It's too good to be true. This can't be real. He can't be alive. They still do not believe it because of joy and amazement. He asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Wow. You will eat in your new resurrected body. Isn't that a good thing to know? Isn't that a good revelation? God will give you that ability, just like Jesus ate here a piece of broiled fish. Notice he didn't have it deep fried. He was healthy conscience, okay? Wasn't blackened or anything like that. It was just a piece of broiled fish, something healthy that he could eat to prove he was a resurrected person with flesh and bones. And he said, because I live, ye shall live also. So folks, I'd like to challenge you, listening out there on your computer or on your tablet, on your phone, I'd like to challenge myself, allow God to open up the scriptures to you. See it in a brand new, fresh light. Begin reading the Bible through again if you haven't done that in a long time. If you're rusty, go back and read the Gospel of John. Great place for everybody to look at who Jesus was and what he did. A man powerful in word and deed, a prophet like they say here in the passage. Open up the scriptures. Let Jesus open up your eyes. Pray that you might understand what scripture is saying. Pray that you might realize how God is speaking to you through the passage because God wants a personal walk with you. And lastly, let your heart be open as your eyes have been opened. And open your heart and let the sun shine in, and I encourage you, open your heart to God and open your heart to others. Perhaps you've been through a situation where you've been burned, you've been disappointed, you've had somebody let you down or betray you, whatever the situation might have been, so you've kind of put a lock on your heart. I encourage you to let Jesus come down and put a key into that lock and open up your heart to him. I guarantee he has good things in store for you if you'd only let him do his work in your life. We've all been hurt. We've all had bad things happen. But if we shut ourselves down and build a wall between us and other people, we'll do nothing but create our own lonely, solitary prison. Open your heart up to the Lord. See what he has for you. Open your heart up to other church members. Open your heart up to people in your community. And I think you'll find you'll begin to be walking in that abundant life that Jesus so promised. Remember what he said in the Gospel of John? The thief, referring to Satan, comes not but to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you might have abundant life. Life and life more abundantly. Ask God what God wants for each one of us. So let him open your eyes, let him open your heart, open up the scriptures and see what good things God has for you. We're in a brand new month, brand new day. We got brand new upper rooms available there in the back. Grab an upper room. If you, if you need to write and get an upper room, give us a shout out or you can write to the address, Google upper room and get a copy of that. Some of you like reading the daily bread. Get along with the Lord. 
have that time with him. Amen. He can open up anything if you give him the key. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the walk to Emmaus and what these disciples discovered when they walked with Jesus. Their dream that had died was made fresh by a brand new dream, a divine dream. Help us find, Father, that divine dream that you have for each one of us. For, Father, you've told us in the scriptures that you have good things planned for us. I know the things I have planned for you to give you a future and a hope. Help us draw closer to you each and every day, Lord, and share our faith, share our experience with others. In Christ's name we do pray, amen. Folks, thank you again for joining in and being with us during this time. I encourage you to go back and study the walk to Emmaus and read it through again in your Bible throughout this week. Uh, I encourage you to let God speak to you through it personally and as you read other scriptures. Remember, next Sunday, May the 8th, we will be having our formal communion. So put aside a little piece of bread and a little bit of juice, and after our message, we'll have our formal communion service. In fact, May 8th is a special day. It's Mother's Day. And I'd like to say to you, even before it comes to all you moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the work you did in raising children. And those of you that are still raising them, God will carry you through.